Rahim. Today we're going to talk about lab number two. Lab number two is when you have received as technicians, today we will be working as technicians, you have received a secondary impression taken from inside the patient's mouth after you have done all dental preparations. So if we revise it, in clinic number one, we received the patient, we made the examination, we made them all the records we need, we took primary impressions. In lab two, we poured these impressions into primary casts, and these primary casts were used, as you remember that you have done it as well, these are used to draw a design on it, okay? So we have drawn an initial design using the surveyor. After we have drawn this design, we have decided, for example, that here we need a rest, here we need a rest, here we need a guide plane, here we, need, we have a high survey line. So we have decided that many teeth need to be altered or changed. So this went back to the clinic. In the clinic, we prepared the teeth inside the patient's mouth. We took another impression, a secondary impression, and then we got a secondary cast. Now this is a new cast that we have, is the secondary cast, and it has all dental preparations ready for it, okay? So we need to go through the process where we produce metal. Metal is produced by a process called casting. So we wrap, we do the form of the metal that we want to do. Okay, this is the metal framework as we would like it to be. We added the clasps, we added major connectors, minor connectors, finish lines. All of these are added to our cast. And then we put it in a ring, and this ring we pour in it the molten metal. We put metal ingots here, we pour it by centrifugation into here. This is now filled in with metal. Once we break it off, we hammer it off, all of the metal around, we hammer it off, we will get the metal as follows, okay? You have got those in detail in the video uh, revising the steps. So, and then with the metal, we cut these sprues off. We cut them off and we get the final metal, okay? Now this is ready for something called metal try-in in clinic number three. Today we are going to concentrate on the actual first step that we begin with when constructing metal. Now notice that to construct this metal and shape it in this way, we usually heat it under a very high temperature. For chrome cobalt, it's more than 1,000 degrees, okay, to melt the metal down and let it flow into the investments, okay? Do you think that our uh, secondary cast material, the stone, can this withstand these high temperatures? The answer is no, okay? If I heat a secondary cast, because this is what is the result from the uh, clinic number two, sir. I took a secondary impression, poured it as a secondary cast. So now, why not work immediately on this and put all of my wax and then put this in the investment ring and then do the metal procedure? This will not tolerate, okay? That stone material, which is the one of the gypsum material, will not tolerate, tolerate high temperatures. What will actually happen is that the moisture remnants of moisture in it will fade away. The dihydrate will go back to unihydrate. Unihydrate is like a powder. This will go back to unihydrate structure. And it will lose all of the communications because you remember that the crystallization occurred, the ability to crystallize occurs when you have a dihydrate, not, not unihydrate. So as if I'm putting it back to the powder form. So it will fracture, it will not stand forces. Other than that, it does not expand to counteract the contraction that happens in metal. When we pour metal, metal is enlarged by heat. Once it cools down, it has a large coefficient of thermal expansion. The coefficient of thermal expansion is high. That means when it cools down, it contracts more, okay? So that means when metal goes from the heated form to the cold form, it contracts a lot. So we need a material that expands in a way that counteracts this contraction here, okay? And this is the investment material. So to really study what happens in investment material when we have heat conversion of the crystals of this material, you have to go back to your dental material books and study that chapter of investment material very well. But the idea is, just to make it short for our prosthodontic lab purpose, is that stone in its actual form will not stand the temperature of uh, metal casting 
So we have to change this cast into a cast that could withstand these uh, temperatures. It is called a refractory cast, okay? Refractory cast material is from a specific type of gypsum. It's not gyp regular gypsum. And it has some binder in the gyps between the gypsum particles. There is some binder, and all of these structures, when they form a cast, this cast has very little uh, abrasive resistance. So it could not resist abrasion. So this cast is very weak and fragile. So we strengthen it by beeswax and then put on it all of our wax. The idea here that we want to turn this into this, the one that withstands the high temperature. This does not withstand high temperature, this does. So how do I go in between these two steps? Before putting in the wax up for the metal, I do a process called duplication. So what is the duplication process? We want to change this cast into this cast that is refractory, made out of refractory material, okay? In between, what do we do? We put this inside the ring. We surround it by a ring. You will see it inside when we do the demo for the uh, duplication. We pour around it material. It, the material could be either agar agar material that you took about from dental materials, or the material could be silicon, duplication material. So we will, we will pour it all around. Once we take it out, we will find that now the impression of the cast is there. And then we pour inside here liquid material that is a consist mixture of investment material mixed according to manufacturer instructions. Once it solidifies, we take it out and we have this called, we call it refractory cast, okay? So a refractory cast is a duplicate of the secondary cast. But before even doing the step of duplication, which is the putting the duplication material around this cast, we have to prepare the cast in a way, a specific way, and this is the purpose of today's lab. So today we're only talking about a step which is called preparation of secondary cast, okay? So this is the, the idea of today's lab. So today's lab, the lab after, and the lab after will all be uh, talking about lab two. Lab two is the most expanded lab in chrome cobalt procedure. It has the one with the most procedures that you do in the chrome cobalt uh, partial dungeon. So what, are, what do we do with it to this cast? We usually add wax. The idea around this cast is just adding wax in a, a controlled <coughs> manner. Each piece of wax we add has a purpose, okay? So by this demo, we will try to divide the additions of wax for each part and tell you why we do it and how we do it, okay? So this is the purpose of today's lab. How do we add the wax to the secondary cast before duplicating it into the refractory cast, okay? And each type of wax added has a reason. And then after we add all of the wax, we do a step called beading, which we will demonstrate as well. So addition of different waxes and then beading. And then we will soak this in water and begin duplicating the cast. Okay, that's in short how we do it. But each part of the wax is added for a purpose. We will be in this demonstration talking about the upper and the lower for your purpose of training, okay? So we will try to uh, divide the demo by that. So we will take a demo like five, 10 minutes video, and then you will go do the step and come back to continue, okay? As we said, we need to convert this secondary cast into this refractory cast by a process called duplication. Before I put my cast into the duplication, I have to pass by a step where I add waxes. So all of my additions are wax. But different types of wax, we have names for each one of them. The waxes come in three categories mainly. They are the block out wax, the shaped wax, and relief wax. Three types, three names, depending on their function. Block out wax, we block out features on the cast, okay? We don't want these features in the final refractory cast. These are called block out wax. Shaped wax, we make specific shapes to receive clasps inside. 
We will see those in a moment. And then we have relief under some of the components of the metal. So block out, shaped, and relief. So our first arbitrary material, or arbitrary addition, is adding wax to the labial undercuts and the, if we have buccal undercuts, that might cause the fracture of refractory cast. We place outside the, the place where metal will be later on, okay? The purpose of this wax addition is to strengthen the refractory cast so it will not fracture during its removal from the duplication material. So it serves nothing for the metal framework. The only service it provides us is to strengthen the refractory cast while taking it out of the duplication material. How do I add it? So it's the one here in red. So how do I add it? I bring utility wax, regular utility wax. Okay. The wax we add it in strips in the undercut areas. So we will have it in strip form, okay? We add the first strip in the deepest part of the undercut, okay? So this is the first strip. The undercut we're going to block out is the undercut away from the abutment teeth. Yani the undercuts and the abutment teeth, we're leaving it. We squeeze it into place. Utility wax is tacky, sticky, صح? by its own. It has beeswax in it, and this makes it sticky. So we squeeze it in place to make it fix in the undercut area, okay? And then we add a second layer of wax. And the second layer is also squeezed to the cast. And then we flush it downwards to cover up all of the undercuts. So it's all finger pressure. You don't need to use the flame unless the, you are in winter. Sometimes the utility wax, even it is playable, it might have gone hard by the uh, temperature, the low temperature. So we're just squeezing it in place, filling in all of the undercuts beneath it. Okay? We don't leave steps. So the part that is close to the teeth, we don't leave steps in them. So we further squeeze them and make them as a flush shape, okay? If you're using heat, just simply run the wax knife over it while it's warm, and it uh, could be sufficient just to use your finger pressure. I have an undercut here that is not filled in yet, so I add more wax to fill it in, and I don't leave any steps in between the added wax uh, segments. So I squeeze them together, and this is the first layer added. I need to make sure that the undercuts beneath the abutment teeth are all, all cleared, so the coverage does not go beneath the abutment teeth, okay? So the area beneath the abutment teeth uh, is clear. And this is called arbitrary blockout. We do it on the upper, and if we have the lower, we also do it on the lower, in the area where no metal is crossing. Okay? Five minutes to do this thing. Okay, I had one question. Uh, is it okay to keep it as a step, as added? Yani when I added it, it, there was a step. No, you should flush it in place. Okay? Make sure it's flush. There is no step between the wax and the stone. The second question is, where do I extend it in the lower part? Into the full sulcus. Okay? The third question, why do I leave it under the abutment tooth clear? Because there are other types of wax we want to place in the area of the abutment teeth because metal crosses here. So there are another type of wax added. So make sure that this under the abutment here, it is clear of uh, the uh, utility wax. Okay, we have this case added wax, but the wax is not added to the full sulcus with. So here we have an undercut in the wax itself. So it did not serve us the purpose that we want. Okay, so when I want to add the wax, I should cover up to the full sulcus width here. Okay, so I would not have an undercut in the wax itself. 
here we have undercuts. So it did not serve the purpose. It should be in the lower part of the sulcus, a bit thicker, okay, to make it all smooth with no undercuts, not in the wax and not in the cast itself, okay? Now, the second blockout we're going to do is a parallel blockout. It's called parallel blockout. And this blockout, to do it, we need to use a paralleling device, which is actually our surveyor, okay? So we need to put back the cast in the same orientation we had during the study cast, okay? And to make sure that we are in the correct orientation, we transfer from the primary cast, where we have drawn the design, the initial design, we transfer our tripoding points, points to the cast. So I have a, a point here, I point here, and another point here. And I make sure, using my analyzing rod, that these tripod points are the same, okay? So going back, what are tripod points? Do you remember when we done the first cast, the first primary cast? So we made the first primary cast. Even before drawing the design on it, we use the surveyor to look for a path of insertion. Okay? In your case of training, we said, leave it as a zero tilt. But in clinical cases, in actual clinical cases, you will have that sometimes we, the patient has severe undercuts of teeth that we tilt the path of orientation just to save the teeth from being prepared a lot, okay? You remember you have done tooth preparations, for example, lowering the survey line or uh, making a guide plane, but the, the teeth are, t are severely tilted, that means we need to remove a lot from the teeth. So rather than removing from the teeth, we just tilt the path of insertion to serve this purpose for us. But for today, if we have those, we just fix this vertical uh, arm on the tripod points, okay? We fix the points in place, and we make sure that the tip of the analyzing rod is touching all three points of the tripods, okay? So if I reorient the cast on the tripod points, if it doesn't touch, I go back, I try to tilt the cast until the, the uh, analyzing rod touches all three of them, okay? So this is how we put the cast back exactly on the same orientation we studied it on lab number one, okay? Or after clinic number one. Because actually the surveying is the responsibility of the dentist, not the technician. It's very important to know this. The surveying and deciding the path of insertion and where to prepare teeth, this is the decision of the dentist, not the technician. So we would say that this is usually done after clinic number one, after the lab had poured the cast, the study cast, then we do this initial surveying. So to make sure this secondary cast, this is now not the same cast as the primary cast that we had in plaster. This is another cast. So how do I make sure this cast is oriented the same as this one? I transfer the points of tripoding from their places here into their new places here because this has the same anatomy. And then I make sure that the, using the analyzing rod, it touches all three points of the tripod at the same time. So this is how I make sure that this cast has the same orientation of the surveying the first time. After I have done finished this step, I, I'm ready to do survey lines. I'm going to draw my survey lines, okay? Because the parallel blockout is a blockout material placed in undercuts. So how do I know where are my undercuts? I need to go back and do surveying. So what do I do? I put my pencil and draw the survey line all around the abutment teeth, okay? And on the lingual or palatal surfaces of all the other teeth, because these are usually the areas that we look for. In my case, when I turn this to this, 
after taking a secondary impression, there are no survey lines. I have to put them back, okay? So now all of my survey lines are there, and then I put on the instrument called chisel. This is the third instrument I'm going to use today for my work, and this chisel is for cutting off wax. This will serve me to cut off excess wax, okay? Because I will be adding wax to areas of undercut that I'm not going to utilize. So how do I do it? I use a different type of wax. So the first wax we used is utility wax, okay? Here we have to change to a second part, uh, type of wax, which is inlay wax, okay? This is inlay wax. You have small blocks of it for your student training purposes, but usually these come in a, in a, desk, a big palette or disc that we can take from. If you touch it, try to touch it now. Try to hold it in between your fingers and touch it. And even try to scratch it. It's the hardest type of wax you have used, huh? It's harder even from base plate wax. This is a hard type of wax. It keeps its shape very well under different laboratory procedures. The wax is also has a lot of good dimensional stability. And it does not, it, it's, it acts very good in producing surface details, okay? So it can be shaped, it can be cut, it's hard, the resultant is hard wax, it can tolerate temperatures of the room, suppose you leave it for a while in a warm room, it will resist the warpage more than other types of wax. This wax is the wax you use also in crown and bridge work, though, okay? So it's called inlay wax or hard wax. It's a different type of wax than what we used earlier. This is the first time you're going to use it in Costa, in removal of Costa, okay? So this is the wax we're going to use. And I'm going to begin adding this wax. Wherever we have an undercut in the area that metal crosses over it, it should be blocked out. All undercuts should be blocked out. But the block out material should not be in excess. It should be exactly parallel to the path of insertion. This is why we use the surveyor later on to scratch the excess material off. We call this block out parallel block out, okay? So how do I add this wax? It's a hard wax. I could not do it by my finger. I have to heat it using the flame, dry flame. We use for this dry flame. So we put the wax. I heat my instrument. Load part of the wax. I melt it in and hold part of the molten wax. And then I spread it under my survey line, okay? So in your case, you have the survey line already drawn on your cast. So we're going to take from the wax and fill in all of these spaces under the survey line. Wh which teeth I'm going to include? I'm going to include all teeth that have metal components on it. You remember that we have drawn a design and we're going to fill in all teeth that have metal crossing over it, okay? Please do it now. We're going to leave 10 minutes for this step for you. Where are you going to place the wax if, without using the survey yet? This is only the step of addition, okay? We're going to put the wax wherever the metal is crossing. So remember the design we have drawn. The metal will be crossing over this abutment, the premolar, and the canine on the other side, and the molar on this side. So all abutment teeth, all undercuts, proximally and lingually. For the anterior abutments, even the undercuts in the buckle are also included in the parallel block out, okay? After we have finished adding of all around the survey lines, I had multiple questions while you were doing the step, so let me answer them before I go to the next stage. First of all, one question was, Doctor, uh, I have no survey line here on the guide plane area. Why? Because we have prepared it. So that means the 
survey line shifted from the upper part, now it's very close to the gingiva. So what do I do in this case? I cover over the gingiva, okay? Uh, now the survey line is lower. I cover below the lower part of the survey line. And this is one of the functions of guide planes. It lowers survey lines, okay? And it makes all of this area, rather than a bulge, it makes it all a flat, and this flatness will serve as a guide plane for the metal framework later on, okay? The second question was, Doctor, we have also lowered the survey line on one of the molars. So also, do I use the uh, new old survey line or the new survey line? Of course, we have here a new survey line. The old survey line is not present on this cast, so? Because we have already prepared it. It was bulging here, but we brought a bear inside the patient's mouth and we removed the bulge. We lowered the survey line to the middle part. So here we only have one survey line, which is the new one. So where do I fill my wax? Beneath the new survey line, okay? The third question that I got, okay, is the areas of retention, wherever I have decided my undercut is present. After I have covered the areas of undercut, suitable undercut, I re-expose them. Just expose the point where I had the undercut, okay? Remember that we put a dot where we have a suitable undercut for my clasp? Those areas, I re-expose them, if they are in, in enamel dimples, remember that some, uh, we have done as practice, we decided that we have looked for a suitable undercut on this abutment, we did not find any, so we prepared an enamel dimple. So fill everything with wax, but then re-expose the dimple you made, okay? Because this dimple now is present on the cast because we took an impression from the patient's mouth. So if you have covered the wax over the dimple area, Re-expose the dimple area because this undercut will be utilized. But all other places other than the utilized undercuts, we cover them all using our blockout, parallel blockout wax. Okay? When you finish the step, this is what you get. You get a color of wax, like a color of wax, surrounding all abutment teeth, buccal and lingual, except for the undercuts that we have exposed. You also have this wax added in bulk beneath the survey line, reaching the marginal gingiva. It should cover the marginal gingiva, okay? So it's added in a bulk, like a band. But it, do I leave it like this, or do I need to do something? I need to do what we call paralleling this blockout material to the path of insertion. How do I do that? I use the surveyor. I use the chisel, wax chisel. And I cut the excess wax because we added it in bulk, so? Okay. We added the wax in bulk. So I need to come down with the chisel and cut out the excess. So once I cut out the excess, if you look closely here, you will find that there is no wax going over the surface. It's exactly parallel to the path of incision. It's also parallel to the guide plane. Do you remember the guide plane we prepared in the patient's mouth? So now everything is in parallel. What does this serve us? I'll show it in a moment. But let me show you the paralleling effect. I use the chisel to cut off. I go around all of this wax. You have two types of chisels. You have vertical chisels and you have side chisels where the blade is here. Whatever type of chisel you have, you simply come down with the blade and cut off the excess wax. Do you see the excess? Cut off, okay? So now all of this wax is parallel to the path of insertion of the metal. So that means the metal, when it comes in and out around this tooth, it will not have any blockage. That's why I make it parallel to the path of insertion, meaning that the wax is exactly parallel to the metal. Suppose the chisel is the metal later on. So the metal can come in and out without any interferences. So this is called parallel blockout. So I run with my chisel all around the, ax, the wax added. Okay, I cut off all the excess wax. 
And now all of the wax added is parallel to the path of insertion. Okay, to show it to you in close, magnified, this is an abutment tooth, okay? And we, here we have metal components on this abutment tooth. What are the metal components we have here? We have a guide plate that has to go in and out, so We have minor connectors connecting the rest going in and out. Now, if I have not made this block out, what happens here in this case, see this to, this is a rest with a minor connector. If I did not block it out, I cannot take it in and out. It's blocked inside the undercut. It's stuck. So it doesn't go in and out easily because there is an undercut left here and the metal went inside this undercut. I cannot take it in and out. But look at the other side where the guide plate has had parallel block out beneath it. See the parallel block out? And this is the guide plane. In metal, we call it guide plate. So of course it comes in and out vertically. So it will come in and out smoothly because the metal was designed away from the undercut. The wax here will turn into investment material. So the metal will not go into this undercut, so it does not stick in. It goes in and out smoothly. Even in the area where we have a clasp, suppose I have a clasp here. Okay, this is a clasp assembly. This is a molar, and this is the minor connector, and this is the rest area. Now, because here I made parallel block out, I can take out this clasp assembly. Now, this is made, suppose the blue material is your metal, and the pink material is the block out material. So I have designed this proximal surface to be uh, parallel to the path of insertion. So I could take this in and out of place without going into the undercut and it will not interfere, okay? Even sometimes when we have a plate, this is the other area. Remember that we've done on other plate, uh, sides. Look at this plate area, okay? This is a plate that touches the tooth on the survey line. When I want to take it in and out, it will glide itself in and out easily without going into undercuts. Why? Because I have blocked all of the undercuts beneath it. So whenever I have a metal component crossing a tooth, it could be in the rest and guide plate area, it could be in the, in the uh, reciprocal plate area, it also could be in secondary class rests, what we have for indirect retention. All of these, wherever metal crosses the teeth, we have to block them. So the metal will come out and in, in one single path of insertion without going into undercuts and interfering. This is, we call, this is why we call it parallel blockout. Why parallel blockout? Because we have used the chisel to cut it off in place so it will not be in excess. Another question, okay, why not to add it in bulk? Why do I have to cut it later on? Look at this abutment. When I first added this wax, suppose that this is the wax I added, okay? Say this is the wax when I added it, okay? It was in bulk. You can notice it's a, there is a bulk of wax before cutting it in parallel, okay? This bulk, if left, and the metal goes over it, the metal will be far away from the tissue. This will accumulate plaque, and secondary calories will happen under my partial denture. So the metal, when it touches the tissue, it should be close enough not to cause secondary caries, but in the same time not go into the undercut. If I have added a bulk of material here, Without cutting it parallel, what will I have beneath this metal on the fitting surface? I'll have a lot of space between the metal and the tooth, okay? This space will accumulate plaque and later on I'll have secondary caries. So why do I add it in bulk first? Just to make sure I fill it in. But then I cut it parallel to the path of insertion, okay? To reduce secondary caries possibilities. Okay, what did we finish in this step? We added wax all around the abutment teeth and any tooth that has a metal component going around it. And we made it all parallel to the path of insertion. So if I'm looking at the tooth vertically, I don't see any of the wax, okay? Because it's all hidden in the undercut areas. Nothing of the wax appears when I look vertically over this tooth, okay? 
So is this is called parallel blockout, and it eliminates any undercut that will not be utilized. But then I told you, well, after we've done the parallel blockout, I told you, please expose the undercuts that we're going to utilize. So I told you to open up any area of undercut we have decided to use. But the problem here, just by opening it up, suppose I want to change this material into, I've done parallel blockout all around the abutment here, and I exposed areas of undercuts that I want to utilize. The blockout eliminated under the cuts. I only left the point where my tip of my retentive arms is going into. The only component of RPD that goes into undercuts, what is it? The retentive arms of clasps. The retentive elements. Either it's a cruiser approaching or gingival approaching clasp. I told you to expose it. But the problem if I change this in color, and they turn it into black and white, or even into the my refractory material. When I look at this, I could not recognize where is my undercut. It's all the same color because I'm going to change this. I'm going to change this into the refractory material. The refractory material all has only one color in it. It doesn't have any other color in it, okay? I change this into this refractory material. So I will not be able to see any of the areas of undercast that exposed. So here I add something called shaped wax or ledging. What is ledging? I want to be able to recognize where is the tip of the clasp going? Because all of this will become one color. I could not see it once it goes into this refractory clasp. So how do I know where my clasp ends? I begin adding extra wax, other than the parallel wax, I begin adding extra wax in the areas where I have utilized, I'm going to utilize undercuts. So here I'm going to use an uh, appro gingival approaching clasp. So what do I do? This is exactly the point of suitable undercut that I checked using the surveyor. So I need to say this is where I should end my clasp. So I add a bulk of wax over this, okay? So when this turns into one color, I could still see the window. This is a window called a window, okay? This shaped wax up is called a window because I exposed where I'm going to put the end of my, of my eye bar, okay? So when I later make my metal, the clasp will exactly go inside this window. That means the tip of the metal is exactly in the undercut that I have measured. So it's not going up, left, or right from the area. I know exactly where to put the clasp of the eye bar, okay? Exactly in the undercut. So if I, it's an, uh, a gingival approaching bar, I just make an umbrella, like an umbrella. It's a U-shape of wax added over the suitable undercut. If you have an enamel dimple, I put the wax over the enamel dimple, okay? So it will be a window. So my eye bar will exactly be in here. A circumferential clasp, if it was a circumferential clasp, I need to know exactly where is this undercut. And I also should know where is my survey line. So what do I add? Here I made it parallel. In the first time I made it parallel block out all around this abutment. But then I add a step, I thicken a step on exactly exposing the survey line. So if I'm looking at this, this step is just below the survey line. I'm just seeing part of the survey line. This will tell me when you go to put the metal, put it here as a reciprocal arm, because this is where the survey line is. If it's on this side, which is the retentive arm, I expose the undercut suitable for the uh, retentive arm, and I make a vertical stop. So this is exactly, this corner is, is exactly the undercut I need. So when I want to come later on and make my metal, this is the clasp, this is the metal I'm going to do. So this retentive arm goes exactly in this angle, okay? See the retentive arm goes exactly in this angle, this retentive uh, part. The reciprocal arm is exactly over the survey line. How did I know that th this is the survey line? By using this step of wax. So this is called shaped block out, and some people call it ledge. Ledge, yani hafe. Okay, 
So this is done on the buccal and lingual of abutment teeth if we are using circumferential class. If it's an eye approaching bar, it's only done on the buccal and we call it a window. Okay? So it's only called a window. This is an abutment. Proximally, it's parallel blockout. Buccally and lingually, it's shaped to blockout. To tell me where do I run my class. So how do I do it? How do I perform it? So this is my blockout material added. I cut it parallel to the blockout already. So here I begin concentrating on the area where is my suitable undercut. This is one. This is the area of the dimple. Okay. So this is the dimple I want to utilize. So what do I do? I bring a small piece of wax over it and I will call this a window. I could use the wax, the, the regular uh, inlay wax, or I could use my utility wax and simply I just turn it around to become like an umbrella, okay? If I want to use the inlay wax, I melt the wax and while it's molten, I begin dripping it around the window that I want to create. Where am I dripping it? Around the dimple. The dimple is still exposed. The dimple is still exposed. I'm just dripping wax around the dimple from the upper side. But if I ask you, what is the wax beneath the, dim the eye bar? What's the type of wax beneath the eye bar? Parallel. Parallel. Block out wax. What type is inlay wax? What is the wax above the eye bar? Shaped window. A block out material. Okay? Shaped block out. Some people, on, you could call it only shaped. Shaped wax. <coughs> I've been asked this question multiple times. Some people are telling me, I want to put this window. Is this window correct? Okay, see this window? This is a very high window. It's more close to the occlusal third of the tooth. The, the window means that this is the area where I should end my clasp. So if this is my eye bar going down, the dome that I added, the qubbe, the I added, the maximum of this dome is exactly where the tip of the eye bar should end. This is very high. Okay? You should actually do this shape exactly over the undercut you've decided. The undercut that we have chosen is an undercut that goes in by 0.202 so, of an inch. And it's 3 millimeters away from the gingiva. So the suitable point is not here. It's somewhere here. So how do I know this? I put my dome exactly over it. So this is a very high dome. The idea is when this material comes into one color material, do you see anything here in colors? No. no. Can I use the surveyor on refractory cast? No. If I put it on the surveyor, it might crush while I'm, uh, while I'm screwing it in place. No, no, this material is very fragile. So I could not put the refractory cast on the surveyor. I could not use the drawing instruments. I could not use the chisel. Because if I use the chisel to cut off something over this, it will cut off the refractory cast itself. I told you, refractory material is very soft material. It's not hard stone, okay? So I could not put this on a surveyor. I could not use the chisel. I could not use the survey instruments, surveying instruments over it. That, that's why I need to put some wax to tell me where are my undercuts that I found using the surveyor. So now this window here, is present and it's exactly where it should be and tells me to end my eye bar exactly in this location. Okay? This is the function of the window, so it should not be high. I had another question where somebody had added the window, somebody had added the window over the eye bar and below the eye bar, beneath it. This is incorrect. The eye bar, when it comes to the tooth, should come in a smooth manner in the lower part. If the dome that I added in the upper part, if I add a dome like it in the, in the lower part, suppose I done it like this, okay? Suppose that I done an upper part and the lower part of this window. What will happen is the metal here, it will have a step inside the metal. This will make the metal weak, okay? 
there is no step between the minor connector and the tip of the eye barb. So this lower part should not contain any wax in it. The lower part beneath the eye bar is the parallel blockout and it's very smooth. So once the eye bar goes into place here, the lower part of it, the connection between the retentive tip and the minor connector is smooth. They are all in one bulk. There are no steps in between. So no stress concentration happens, okay? So the windows added above, not below the eye bar undercut that we found for, suitable for the eye bar. Somebody was asking me about the thickness here. <coughs> How much do I make this thick? When he, uh, here he added wax, and he's asking me, how thick do I make it? I make it thick enough to find that there is a step when I put my fingernail on it, or I put my la lacron tip on it. There is no resistance here, Mafi step. But on his buckle side, no, I can't find resistance. This does not slip away. I have, and I also could see the edge. So the buckle addition is correct. The lingual addition me needs more thickness to see the step. So the thickness should be enough to be seen visually. So if I'm looking at this vertically, I could see a step here, and I could see a step here, okay? Somebody else was asking me, do I do it on all abutments, the buckle and lingual steps or ledges? Do I do it on all abutments? No, you only do it on circumferential clasp abutments, okay? Now here we have a clasp running here. We have a clasp running here. We need to know where they are. But here we don't have a clasp. We don't have a reciprocal arm on the lingual of this canine. Okay? It's not, we have it a plate. The plate should run from the tissue to the rest smoothly. So the, the blockout beneath it is parallel blockout, uh, parallel blockout. It's not shaped. Okay? So the shaped blockout is uh, uh, buckly on the eye bar only. Only buckley. In the circumferential class, it's buckling lingual to accommodate the buckel, retentive arm, with lingual bracing arm. Okay? Clear? Okay. We finished the block out. We have two types of block out arbitrary and parallel block out. Those we finished them. Now, the shaped wax up. The shaped wax up are the ledges and the windows. We finished both of them. Now we go to something called relief. This is the one that has a lot of detail in it, okay? Relief. So what are the reliefs we add? The relief, like the blockout, have two types. Arbitrary and gauged relief, okay? Or controlled relief. We control it by using the gauge, the thickness of the material, okay? This is how we control it. So what is gauged and what is arbitrary? A relief, the idea of relief is that the metal should not touch the tissue directly. And these sometimes are similar to denture work. Do you remember where we made tissue static in patients? These are the same areas. It's wherever we have thin mucosa. So these include, and these we do arbitrary, arbitrary relief, meaning that it's enough just to wipe wax over it and these are the areas where the eye bar cross, okay, under the eye bar. This is why the abutments that have an eye bar, we did not block them out. If we have, if we have an undercut, we block the undercut and then over the gingiva, here we make a relief. So here is a question I know somebody will be asking. What if I have an undercut? If the undercut is mild, I'm allowed to do an eye bar, but block out the undercut, the mild undercut in the lower part, Block out the mild undercut in the lower part and make relief over it, okay? If it's severe undercut, all of the eye bar is contraindicated. In areas where we have soft tissue undercuts, all of the, un the eye bar is contraindicated in this case. I have to change to a closer approaching class, okay? But it's a minor undercut, a very minimal undercut. I close, block out the undercut in the lower part in the bulge area, I should do my arbitrary relief. Arbitrary relief, how do I do it? I just take out wax from, uh, from, the, uh, from my inlay wax. I just take some wax out, melt it, and then 
why wipe it, wipe this wax over the tissue okay using a hot instrument i spread the molten wax and this is where metal is contact with thin mucosa remember that sometimes patients lose some of the keratinization over undercut if i have a bony bulge here if the eye bar wants to come in contact with this tissue it should not be rubbing over the attached gingiva it should be a bit away. This bit away is like using this wax, spreading this wax out. If it's a, also in the lower, not only in the eye bar position, I also do it beneath the lingual plate or lingual bar. So once more, I take molten wax, I put it in place and spread it. Sometimes here we use very thin gauged wax. I could use it. So i done it by spreading, but also I could do it by gauged wax. But here I use a very thin wax, gauge 30. It's a very thin type of wax. So this is gauge 30 wax. I could use this with gauge 30. This is a very thin wax. And I just place it in the area where the lingual bar is going to pass. In, I could use this gauge 30 beneath the eye bar on the soft tissue side, not the tooth side. On the tooth, underneath the eye bar on the tooth side, it's parallel wax. On the tissue side, it's gauged, thin gauged wax, gauge 30. So I could place some of this wax. I could substitute this by just wiping, taking out molten wax and wiping it on the surface. This is sufficient, okay? Relief, I relieved. That means the metal is not touching the soft tissue directly, okay? So, we have arbitrary relief, we, the ones we done under the eye bars. We could use gauged relief or arbitrary relief under the lingual plate. There is another relief, arbitrary relief, when I am, if I'm going to use a lingual plate, metal will be crossing over marginal gingiva. Any marginal gingiva that will be crossed by metal should be filled in with wax, okay? So I spread molten wax around the marginal gingiva of all teeth that will be crossed by metal. Why do I need this? For the protection of marginal gingiva. The marginal gingiva should not come in contact with the metal components. Suppose I'm going to use a lingual plate here. If I'm not going to use a lingual plate, no need to block it out. Okay, suppose this is the open design. This is the upper open design. There is no metal going here. So here I don't need to place any arbitrary relief, okay? So this is arbitrary relief. Beneath, uh, marginal gingiva, beneath the eye bar, and beneath the lingual plate. But the lingual plate, I have another option to use gauged relief. The last wax added, for the arbitrary relief is in the rugi area. The rugi area is very rough. If you can see this refractive cast, it's very rough. So if metal goes in and out these valleys, it can traumatize the tissue because it's not smooth there. So what do we do? Before duplicating it, I bring some molten wax, put it over the rugi area, and then using a very hot instrument, spread it. Okay, and go over it. What will happen is it will pull inside the valley and go away from the crest of the rugi area. So this makes a relief. Now, some patients, some patients, they have a very prominent rafi area. Yani the bone here is very prominent. Also, those patients, I add wax over the prominence and then I spread it over it to relieve it. It's more that if it's obvious and clearly seen, here I go, if it's a small torus, a, a, a very small, yeah, just an elevation, I could use relief. Other than that, I have to change the design of the metal itself, okay? So, the last point of arbitrary relief is the rugi area, and if slightly prominent, the suture area, the mid palatal area, okay? The final wax I add is in the saddle areas. This is also called a gauged relief. I use thicker wax. This wax has gauge 24. 
The gauge is opposite to the thickness. The lower the gauge, the higher the thickness. I add pieces of wax in the saddle area. And the way I add them are the following. I cut pieces, rectangle pieces. I adapt them to the surface, but they should be away from the block out, parallel block out by one millimeter at least. And then they are cut here at 90 degrees. And these will form what we call internal finish lines, okay? So what are their specifications? What are the specifications of this wax? The gauge is gauge 24. It's put as much as long posteriorly, but anteriorly it should not touch, be touching the parallel block out. There should be one, one and a half meters in between empty. They end in a uh, uh, 90 degrees sharp angle. In the free and saddle, I put a stopper in them. So I open a stopper here. In the bounded saddle area, it's the same thing. I adapt this rectangle. I keep the wax free from the parallel block out by one to two millimeters. Here it's short by one to two millimeters. These are not connected. What will happen here, the metal will be touching here. Touching here, they will act as stoppers. The area that is filled in now with wax will later become the area under the metal ready for acrylic. Do you remember that we need space for acryl? If the metal is exactly, if I don't do this step, if the metal is put exactly over the saddle area, I will not have place for acrylic to go beneath it. So we need to embed this uh, mesh area or resin retention area. So when I, once I go to a refractory cast, what I will I find? I will find that the refractory cast here is raised. Okay, there is some space. The metal, I construct it above this immediately. But once I put the metal over the original cast, the metal will be far away from it, and I will have space for acryl to come in. This is a finished metal framework, for example. I put it in place. If you look closely, there is some space beneath it. I could put my tip of my instrument beneath it. How did I give the space? By gauged relief that I placed in this step, okay? So what you're going to do now, you're going to do the two types of relief, the arbitrary and the gauged relief. The arbitrary relief is placed under eye bars. The gauged relief is under the lingual plate or lingual bar. Notice that there's space here. I could put my instrument. And the gauged relief is put in the saddle areas. Okay? So the metal will not be touching the tissue once it finalizes. Okay? Let's take 15 minutes for this stuff. I have a question here is where do I place my gauged relief I'm, if I'm using the gauged one, not the uh, molten wax type. This In this area, I just added molten wax and I spread it beneath the lingual plate. If I'm using the very thin gauged material, I could add it in wherever the m lingual bar is touching the tissue. I avoid the saddle areas. The saddle areas have a different relief. It will gauge relief size 24. So if I'm going to place this, I make it thin. If it's a lingual bar, uh, bar, I make it in the same thickness of the lingual bar. I put it in place. I put it in place. And then, after I attach it and make sure it's attached very well, I could further spread it using an, the instrument. If it's very thin, I, I don't need to spread it, but uh, so I'm just going to seal it in place and at the same time spread it. So wherever the metal is passing by, I make this relief. Once more, if I'm, I'm melting it down and spreading it, this is called arbitrary relief. If I use a piece of wax that has a very thin gauge, it's called gauged relief, but the same idea. It's making the metal not touch the tissue in the lingual side because the lingual slope of the sulcus has very thin mucosa. And if the metal rubs over it while going in and out, it will traumatize the tissue very, uh, in this area. Okay? This is a case of a student that came where she did the shade block out far away from the survey line. You could clearly see the survey line. 
صح؟ The shaped lookout should be exactly below the survey line. I could, I should see it, but not like this. If you make it like this, far away from the survey line, that means the body and the tip of the clasp is all under the undercut, and this cannot be done. The metal is so per, uh, so stiff, it could not go into this undercut. It will be blocked there. Okay, only the tip should be under the undercut. So here you should cover the shape just beneath the the survey line. I should see the survey line. Because the body of the class should run on the survey line. So it's just below it. Except for the tip, this, this is where I should make my angle. Okay? Question okay. came is, where do I extend my arb arbitrary relief? Where do I extend the arbitrary relief in the lingual area of the lower? It's not over here only. It should be spread over all of the parts where the metal will be running. So it should extend up to here. Okay, see this arbitrary relief? Arbitrary relief. This is the lower. It should go in the lingual side as well. Arbitrary relief should go in the lingual side as well. The second question is about the gauge relief over the saddles. How much do I go buccally and lingually? Buccally, I don't know. need to go to the full sulcus depth. I end it close to the saddle area midway, okay? And this is where the eye bar will come in. Wherever the metal will go out of it, it's 90 degrees. It's cut 90 degrees. In the free and saddle area, it should reach the sulcus, especially where it connects with the major connector. In bounded saddle, I'm okay to make it short from the sulcus here and short from the sulcus here, okay? It's shorter than the major connector in the bounded saddle area. The free and saddle area, it should reach into the sulcus in this area, the mesial part, where it meets the major connector. This is it. And this is incorrect. Here, you should extend it to the full sulcus depth in this area. Okay? Bounded saddle area, short from here, shorter than the margin of the major connector, and here, shorter than the loop of the eye bar. Shorter. Okay? The upper... In the upper, it should extend beyond the abutment teeth on the palatal side, allowing acryl to come in. On the buccal side, you, you, it doesn't matter because acryl will fill in all of the space. Okay? You could end mid sulcus point. Maratani, fill upper, so al upper. In the palatal side, it should extend from the gingival part, palatal gingival margin. More palatal on the buccal beyond the marginal gingiva, just short of the loop of the eye bar. It should be short. This is the eye bar loop, so it should be shorter than the eye bar loop. So, this is the eye bar, and it's shorter from the eye bar loop. Okay, it should end here. I should end it here? Yes, okay. I have a question here that she added the wax in the saddle areas, but it keeps going out. Once you adapt it by finger, remember, don't squeeze it, because we want to maintain its thickness. But it keeps slipping out, so what do you do? You bring your instrument, heat it, and then run around it, melting the wax around. Okay? It will seal it. Don't melt the wax in the proximal areas. Only melt the wax in the lower areas. Don't touch this wax in the saddle areas, over, crossing over the saddle. Okay, Mara, seal it from the buccal. Don't touch the sharp cuts on the proximal sides. Seal it buccally from here to here. Don't touch the 90 degrees angle on the proximal side, okay? Here, here should be clear cut 90 degrees to make the finish line. Here, this is a bounded saddle. Where do you cut it before sealing it? You should have cut it away from the margin and gingiva and shorter from the major connector. It should be shorter. And over the relief. See the 90 degrees? Here, the 90 degrees is kept. I don't seal it in the bounded saddle area. In the lower saddle area, here I seal it. 
But here I told you I needed to go into the sulcus. Yani this is shallow. I have to go like this. Here. I should reach the sulcus in this side. Because this is where I should reach the... Okay. In the lower part here, it should reach the sulcus. So I'm going to change it. Why? Because here the major connector meets this. It should have a sharp finish line. So the seal goes here, away from the connections. Here you have a problem that the relief is covering the eye bar, so I make it short from the eye bar. Okay? The loop should be exposed. The loop area of your eye bar should be exposed. Okay? For the, she's asking about the upper. Away from the marginal ginger cervicali and away palatally. Palatally should be sharp cut. Should be 90 degrees sharp cut. Very sharp cut. Okay? The, I see it from back, I see it buckly. Yes. I had another question about arbitrary uh, relief. Here you have already drawn your design, your possible design. So the, our design is not a plate, it's not covering the teeth. So there is no need for arbitrary relief on the rugi and the uh, marginal gingiva here because it's not included in the metal. Mm -hmm. Relief is not what, what's under the metal. Relief is under the metal. Okay. So what's the type of waxes under the metal? The relief type will parallel block out type. But arbitrary block out, it's outside the metal framework. Okay, okay. this the, a good example showing incorrect uh, addition of relief here. Here we do cover the retromolar pad, but on the anterior part, we should make a space between this wax and this wax. This is the parallel block out, صح? And this is the gauged relief. I should leave at least one to two millimeters between them because I want metal touching here. The metal should touch on this tissue. It will act as a stopper here. Here I opened this uh, 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 window for the stopper posteriorly, okay? So here I should not make this wax touch this. They should uh, run one to 1.5 millimeter between them. And I should uh, have an anti degrees cut vertically in this wax. I don't seal it here. Okay. Here, uh, here is correct in terms of here it is correct in terms of the connection, but it should be 90 degrees. You have you have sealed it. You should have it 90 degrees here. Okay, because metal here the acryl will meet metal. Okay. One thing here that you should be away from the one should one thing here you should be away from the eye bar. You're correct here. Lingually, if you go into the sulcus, it's okay. Banded saddle area. No, you should not reach the sulcus. You should be away from the sulcus, uh, around uh, four or five millimeters lingual to this. Here it's 90 degrees. I have, sh sh I should have cut it 90 degrees. Here, clear these proximals. Here they are touching. Clear this proximal and clear this proximal and cut it in the 90 degrees. She's asking if this is correct. No, because here this is your margin of major connector, sah? And this is your margin of the wax. They meet together. In major connector will wax meet together. They should not. Then this is if this is where acryl should finish. Acryl should finish away from the margin of the metal. See the difference? So this is now in between. Here I have an internal finish line, a sharp internal finish line. They should not meet with the edge of the major connector. Palatally, this is too much palatally. I should just go beyond the marginal gingiva, around five to six millimeters. Acryl will not reach up to here. Just beyond the margin of gingerbread, yes. yes. Okay, this is a good one. Okay. She made the seal where she removed the 90 degrees junction between this and this. Okay? Here you will not have an internal finish line. Internal finish line means that this will all be filled in acryl later on. Okay, so when I have a 90 degrees between here and here, when the major connector ends here, here the acryl will not be in 90 degrees and not have enough bulk, so it will fracture off. Okay, this, this is excellent, Awalishi. This is excellent. Clear work, shipping 90 degrees, KF. Clearance from proximal. Okay, away from the gingiva. It should go into the sulcus, this is correct. I'm sorry. Uh, I uh, the relief, you can extend it to the retromar pad area, but the stopper, you should make it below it. So you should have a stopper. Okay, she made the relief here only. You should have extended here because there is a part of the major connector going here. Okay? No, no, under the major connector. In the, in the bound and area, I extend the lingual bar 
to come here. Okay. So it should send the, the relief, the arbitrary relief. Okay, this is too much thick as arbitrary relief. Too thick. So just reduce it. So reduce the bulk of it. Now melt it and spread it more. Okay. Yes, here in the United States, it's a tissue window. Home. Oh. Okay, the final step we should do after we have done all of these waxes, this step is only made in the upper, because remember when we have the upper cast, when it comes, when the upper, when we first pour it, we don't, we have all of these areas flat. If we have the upper, we have all of these areas flat. If I put metal over this and it becomes solid metal, air will come beneath the metal and sometimes food. So I need to make a peripheral seal. How do I make peripheral seal? By carving in the stone what we call beading lines. In posterior part, it's similar to the post dam function. Do you remember the post dam function? It compensates for the shrinkage of acryl. It prevents the ingress of food from posteriorly. It makes a good seal because we want the air to go out from beneath the partial. All of these functions are served by the beading line. But I could not carve in a full post dam in metal. Scan, I could not carve all of this. This is the post dam we have, the drawing of the post dam. I could not carve a full post dam with all of its measurements into this. It will be too much harmful, and metal could, not, could uh, compress the tissue and start to adjust. It's not like acryl. If this is compressed in acryl, I could simply just uh, trim from the acryl, it's easier. But if it's metal, we don't make a full post dam. We only make what you call beading lines. The beading lines are lines that run on the drawing that we have. This line draws on the posterior design that we have drawn uh, and decided that our metal will reach, okay? So how much do I carve inside? I carve 0.5 millimeter up to maybe one millimeter in the soft area. It goes in the posterior area, it could go posteriorly to the hamular area. But in the dentate area, but in the dentate area, it should reach the posterior margin or around the abutment. But it, once it comes closer to the abutment, it fades away. I should not carve close to the abutment. This beading line here should not extend to the abutment. If it does, it will traumatize the marginal gingiva. Okay? So the beading line ends away from the marginal gingiva by around six millimeters. So it's away from the marginal gingiva. Okay? So the beading line is a line that I carve inside the stone. I make a depression in the stone. The thickness, the depth of it, it's one, it's 0.5 to 1 millimeters. It's 0.5 to 1 millimeters. And it ends before the marginal gingiva by 5 to 6 millimeters, OK? In the anterior one, the anterior beading line also goes on where, my, where I decided to end my design. Where did I end my design? In this area. I included this abutment in a plate. I included this abutment in a plate. And I'm ending my design here. It should run by the, by the same dimensions. But here I choose not to run over the rugi area. I choose to run it in the valleys of the rugi area. OK? Not over the crest of the rugi, but in the valleys. And in the uh, posterior and anterior, both of them, they should cross the midline perpendicular, not oblique. OK? So they don't have the same thickness or depth of post dam, but they serve the same function that post dam serves. Okay, we don't. We have posterior and anterior in the upper. If I'm using an open anterior area, if I don't, I'm not using an open anterior area. I'm, I'm doing a plate full palatal coverage. I don't need an anterior beading line. Okay, the anterior beading line is only needed if I'm using the open design, where I'm freeing the marginal gingiva anteriorly. In the lower, in the lower. There are no beading lines at all. Because the mucosa here is very thin. It could not tolerate any carving in it. If metal projects towards the tissue, it will easily traumatize thin mucosa there. 
okay? So those are the steps that you need to finish. And five minutes for this step. And after that, you can go for a break, 15 minutes. And come back just to see inside the lab the material for duplication and the process of duplication. After we finish the wax up and we have made all of these features, all of these features in wax, we are ready now to do the duplication step. We have added the wax, different types, in arbitrary and uh, all types of blockout, all types of shaped wax and gauged relief and other types of relief. We have done the beading lines and this cast is soaked in water and then it's ready after that to be uh, duplicated in investment material. So we place this, this cast inside. We put this cast in duplication ring and then we close it and then we begin pouring in from the sides here a material that is able to take a duplicate of the uh, cast. We could either use agar-agar material. This material is a reversible material. If I heat it in a controlled manner, it will be, go back to be flowable. And then once it's flowable, I pour it inside this uh, ring, and it will flow all around the cast material and take the shape of it. Once it's finished, I open this and could take it out inside the material. The other, the, so this is agar agar material. The other material I could use is silicon. It's a rubber material that also could be poured. So suppose that this was here. I take it out, take out the cast, and then mix my investment material. The investment material is a material that withstands high temperature. So it comes in packets. It's a type of gypsum material. And I, according to the manufacturer instructions, I mix the liquid and powder under vacuum and then pour it once it's finished. Uh, after mixing out, pour it inside. And once it solidifies, I could take it out of the duplication material. And this is a very specific step where we are very accurate once we do it. We try to be very accurate. And then what I get is a cast that is duplicate of this cast that we have done. So it's the same cast, but different material. This is refractive material. This was secondary cast. It has all of the features of the wax up, but it doesn't have any wax actually on it. Refractive material is ready to add components for the wax up and metal to be uh, turned. This wax up will be turned into metal using the investment process later on. So this refractory cast is the same material as this investment around it. So the same material, here it's made as a cast. After we add the wax, we add this material around it. And this is how we make the metal.